surprise, surprise. I'm your host, Mike Bankhead, bass player, songwriter, Dayton, Ohio. I was not expecting to bring you a podcast episode today. The official debut of this podcast is really January 5th. I'm calling this one episode one half. This is a conversation with Juliet Fromholt, music director of WYSO. I'm happy to have her here. On the You Could Be My Aramis podcast, we talk about our favorite albums of 2021. This is about as much as you are ever going to hear me talk on a podcast. Let's get to it. Hey there, Juliet. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm sure I introduced you properly in the voiceover, which I haven't recorded yet. But in case I didn't, how about you summarize how much of a media professional you are? (laughs) Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, I am the music director at WYSO, the public radio station for Southwest Ohio. Um, And as part of that, or in addition to that, I host two shows on the air every week. uh, Kaleidoscope, which is my indie rock alternative uh, kind of college rock show. And then Alf Rhythms, which is my new age chill electronica Sunday night show. Um, I'm also a podcaster and a writer and a doer of many things. <laughs> yes. Your knowledge of music is, I believe, encyclopedic would be a good word. Oh, well, thank you. That's a, that's a compliment. <laughs> I meant it as a compliment, and that's why we're here. This is December 30th, 2021. The year is almost over. And even though you just did this on the air last night, I was not able to catch the entire show. So I'd like to talk about our favorite albums of the year. And it seemed like last night, I caught some of the show. You were going mm-hmm. back and forth with the gentleman you had. I don't know if you want to do it that way or you want to change it up. Do you have a thought on how you'd want to discuss your favorite stuff? I'm happy to do it whatever way um, whatever way makes best sense for you. Um, I have no idea. I've never done one of these before. <laughs> Well, so we we go back and forth on the air because, you know, we're playing the full songs in between and it's live radio. And it also gives us a chance to kind of take a breath in between, like while the two sets of two songs are playing. Um, We've done it a couple of ways over the years. So we can we can kind of go back and forth like our number tens or number nines, if if that's cool with you. That's fine. So I'm not going to actually play any full songs unless they're local artists. And the reason for that is copyright stuff. And the local artists, I'm going to reach out to them personally if, if, well, if I have the time to get it in here. But in the show notes, I'll put links to everybody's stuff. Dear listener, so if it's a local artist from Dayton, go listen to their stuff. Please. That's important to us. So, uh, yeah, ladies first. All right. So my number 10 was Arlo Parks' album, Collapsed in Sunbeams. And I love Arlo Parks. This is a debut album. Um, it's such a groove while still being kind of deep and kind of moody. It's uh, it's one of those albums that you can like sit down and listen to or you can kind of put it on and be doing stuff around the house and and grooving out to it a little bit. I, I'm really, really impressed by this debut effort and I'm excited to see um what the future holds for this artist a couple things one she's english yes two didn't that album come out in january like nearly a year ago it did yes so that really speaks to how much it impacted you that it held up the entire year right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. often january releases you know i tell people if you if you want to get it on top 10 lists Don't release your album in December and don't release your album in January because December you'll invariably miss everybody's lists and January you'll just get forgotten. Um, If you don't have people who keep good lists, which I'm varying degrees of bad or good about that. Um, But yeah, this one I've been playing all year on the station. Like every time I'm like, Oh, I've been playing this a little too much. Like two weeks later, I'm right back to it because I enjoy it so much. Which is, I mean, that's what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. So other than my number one, I didn't really order mine. Okay, Which is that's fine. fine. I'll, I'll just save that one for last. Uh, so I'll start with the Jerry Cantrell record that he put out this year. An old dude, Jerry Cantrell, uh, the main songwriter from Alice in Chains in the 90s, and he's done plenty of solo work. But his latest solo record just seems more nuanced than some of the other stuff he's done. I mean, it still sounds like him. But like the melodies are just, it's re- and there's a song on there called Nobody Breaks You, which I will link to in the show notes over on YouTube. And I've been listening to it nonstop for like three weeks. So yeah 
I went That's old guy. awesome. Yeah. I mean, so so I always I always love talking about that. Like when you have an artist like Jerry Cantrell, that like you know, for for people of a certain age, and I'm motioning to you and I here. Yes. Um, you know, has has been a part of our musical ecosphere, kind of coming all the way up. Um, what is it? what is it like to be able to, you know, discover something new or interesting from an artist that's been, you know, a part of your musical lexicon for so long? For me, it's just nice to not be disappointed. And I don't mean that in a derisive way, but there were a lot of 90s artists that put out music this year. And a lot of it just didn't move me. So some of the stuff on my list in that category, uh, Cannabox put out a new record. It's not bad, but eh. Matthew Sweet put out a record. It sounds like a Matthew Sweet record. I didn't think it was as great as the ones released in the 90s. Teenage Fan Club, Garbage, Sleater Kenny, Liz Fair, Toe the Wet Sprocket, Quicksand. Those are all 90s bands that put out music. And at least for me, I thought Jerry Cantrell's effort was the best of all of them. Your mileage yeah. might vary, right? Thanks. Uh, all right, let's go to number nine. All right. Uh, number nine for me was Indigo D'Souza's Any Shape You Take. Um, a really great... Kind of poppy, but but I always I'm always hesitant to use the term poppy because that turns some people off, and I want people to really like check these albums out. But um, a really solid you know pop album uh, with great pop sensibilities, but really craft well crafted songs, um, fun and serious. There again, that's a lot of my picks this year. Kind of balancing out you know something you can kind of nod your head to and move around to with lyrical substance. Um, she's a new to me artist and I'm I, I like, just like Arlo Parks, I'm really excited to see um, where she goes from here. She's one of several Latinx artists that are on my list this year. And that was not necessarily intentional in my listening, but I'm really thrilled um, that so many artists from that particular community are on my list this year, because there's some great stuff out there that I'm yep. just getting turned on to. So first, I want to talk about the term poppy. Yeah. Because that could mean a lot of different things. Can. Maybe that just means that it's really hooky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe that means something about the specific manner of production and instruments chosen. Like, you know, maybe they use fake drums and do it all on a laptop, which nowadays that's what pop music is. Maybe it's the vocal approach. So which one of those do you think applies to the Indigo de Souza record? Which I listened to, by the way, specifically because mm -hmm. you recommended it to me. I would say it's a combination of the fact that it's really hooky, uh, the vocal approach, and a little bit of the production, though not in a more in a traditional pop sense, in that it's tight production, it's you know designed to have movement throughout the song, um, not necessarily the sort of modern pop sensibility, which is, as you say, you know, um, electronic drums, a lot of autotune, things like that. We don't see as much of that on this album. Um, it's more in the production as it comes to the song craft rather than the instrumentation. See, that's, and I know when you, like, if you're looking for shorthand, you can't say all that, but for someone that was <laughs> doubting whether they might enjoy that record, and I did enjoy that record, that's a description that might kind of clarify what you mean when you say, hey, it's kind of poppy. Uh, Absolutely. All right, so the next one on my list, which again, I don't have them in any order other than number one, is Cincinnati's Own Lung their record come clean right now which i saw them right before we went into the first lockdown of 2020 and it shame on me but it's my first time seeing them and they're just a, you know how could a cello and a drummer make all that noise it's just a maelstrom of energy and sound i feel like they really capture that on this album and of course in the studio you can layer your cello tracks and you can harmonize with your vocals and double track your vocals and so it's, it's the same energy that they get from playing live but just kind of a more lush and sculpture sound because they were in the studio and they're great and i hope that the pandemic doesn't knock them off their game too much they're one of those bands that likes to go tour the world and take their music to the people and that's been hard for them but yeah lung they're great go go get that record yes i that that record will be appearing a little later on my list in fact <laughs> okay that's that I think you professionals call that a tease, right? In the yes, business. Exactly. In in the business, as we say. <laughs> All right. Number number eight. The number eight for me is Zinia Rubinos Una Rosa. Um, this album um 
she's a new to me artist, although she has been releasing work for a couple of years now. Um, I fell in love with one of the singles. So, you know, in radio world, we get a lot of singles before we get the full album. And that can be a really good thing sometimes in the case of people like Xenia Rubinos, who I might not have known about otherwise, and I get interested in because of a singular song. Sometimes it can be a bad thing. Um, you know, sometimes it's just the one song that's worth checking out. But um, Xenia Rubinos' whole album is worth checking out. Um, she is a, a brilliant musical mind. She studied jazz composition, and you can really hear that in her work, although it is not, it's not jazz at all, you know, but you can hear that sort of jazz sensibility in her work, in her ability to experiment and to do some non-traditional things with uh, melody and style and instrumentation. And, and I love it. It is, it is uh, such a catchy album. And every time I play one of her songs, like, Somebody, whether it's somebody at the office who just happens to be around while I'm doing my show or somebody on Twitter is like, ooh, what was that? So she's kind of an artist that commands your attention. So that's another one that I heard because she recommended it to me. That's going to be like a mantra. So full disclosure, <laughs> listener, I reached out to Juliet a couple, you know, almost a couple months ago to see where she was on her end of the year list and I, to pitch her to come talk to me on this podcast. And then she just gave me a list of stuff that she had listened to that she was considering. And so many of it I had missed. And so, hey, more homework. <laughs> so when you hear me say, I only found this record because Juliet recommended it, that's very true for a lot of these. I might not have even discovered it, which is, you know, that's why we should talk to people who are not us to find out what they're listening to, right? Absolutely. Uh, the next one for me is another one that I wouldn't have found without Juliet. It's the Yola record, Stand For Myself, who is also English, but she sounds like she's from the South. Like, she sounds like a gospel soul singer, right? Um, yeah. Which, you know, that's, that's the kind of vibe that she's channeling. But she's English. And a little aside, so I have, I have an uncle in, the, in Brooklyn, older fella, right? He's in his 70s now, but former musician and just loves, just a music nerd like us. But not the, he doesn't really listen to indie rock. So we, we have a little disconnect, but so I've been on his, at his urging as I get older, getting more into Americana and country and soul and blues because he used to tell me, well, that's our music too. It's just as much as, this, you know, specifically country. That's, it's a young person. I didn't hear it. Now I get it, right? Country has got super black roots. So when I try, when I find artists that are in that space, folk, Americana, roots music i guess we could say I, I sometimes try to surprise him but you know hey i found one you might not know about i thought that yola was going to be it nope he's already got all of her old stuff <laughs> like, amazing uh, like, okay. <laughs> i should not be surprised that he already knew about her but um but she's coming to the tapped in march yeah if it yes. doesn't get canceled um and i i can't wait for that show so thank you for discovering or for helping me to discover Yola because I might not have found her otherwise. You are very welcome. Funny enough, Yola is my number seven. So let's go. That's a beautiful segue. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I, um, I didn't know about her old stuff. Um, one of the promoters I work with turned me on to her. They were like, Hey, check out this album. And at first, you know, with a name like Yola, you think she's going to be maybe more in the pop, realm in the r&b realm nope like straight up like soul americana and a british artist which is great she just blew me away and i heard a couple of really great interviews with her i believe it was fresh air and world cafe that just made me love her as an artist the way she talked about um wanting to bring her politics into her music in a more authentic and personal way, um, wanting to bring her experience as a Black woman into her music and to celebrate and uplift that experience. Um, it, it just made me um, love her music and love her as an artist even more. I love it when an artist, you know, really brings some of themselves and their convictions into their work. And she's doing that in a really authentic way. And she's somebody that I absolutely want to see live because I bet she can just tear it up on stage. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can find that date. And it shouldn't take me too long because I have it in my calendar, March 12th, which is a Saturday, 8 p.m. Tap Theater. I'll be like in the seventh row. Nice. Assuming that, you know, 
you're still having concerts then yeah exactly everything uh, with an asterisk these days right. <laughs> so my my favorite songs from that album were uh, barely alive which i think is the opening track uh, mm -hmm. diamond studded shoes and starlight i liked it all yes. but those are yes. the ones that really popped out for me yeah starlight's the one i get stuck in my head all the time yeah it's so it's so it's such a good album it is uh so my next one is uh valerie june's album the moon and stars prescriptions for dreamers and this was recommended to me by uh, the americana songwriter in tennessee named greg owens he's the gentleman that co-wrote won't love you anymore with me from my, oh, nice. my previous record so we talk about music you know and he recommended that to me and i went and listened to it and then i went and listened to it again and then i went and listened to it again and yeah it's awesome Here's what I wrote about it in my in my blog about it. Uh, soulful, subtly groovy, elegant, relaxing, moving, and beautiful. That's, and it's again, very rootsy. It's in that kind of blues, kind of gospel, kind of Southern, kind of folk, kind of Americana space. Maybe even a little country adjacent, but just such, so much feeling and maybe even a little bit of melancholy in the, in the voice. Definitely. It's a good record. Yeah, that that is um, one of my honorable mentions. It nearly made my list. I, there are so many hard choices this year. Yeah. I, oof. <laughs> yeah. Last year was easier because there weren't as many releases. <laughs> well, I, mean, I feel like folks got just that little taste of, oh, we have three weeks to leave the house. Let's go to the studio, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Valerie June almost made my list. Very, very close. Uh, what's number six? Number six for me is Gelato Negro's Far In. Uh, this album is just such a groove. It's so it's so good. And it it just puts you in such a chill space. I love it. Um, it's it's the type of album that if I'm being realistic could actually fit on either of my radio shows, which is pretty cool. That that is a rare album indeed, um, that can work on both shows. Um it's it's catchy without being kind of intrusive or too aggressive um and it's just so so soothing and i i love it the songcraft is excellent um i'm a big fan of Hilado negro going way back and when you have an artist that's really on the rise like he is um it's exciting to see that artist continue to both innovate and honor what makes them so great um and not to not to lose that when when they're starting to get finally get the laurels that they absolutely deserve for their music which i think he's starting to finally get he's getting press which he did yeah. earliest in his career and this is another album i discovered because julia told me about it uh but yeah i try to do my research i then i started reading about the, the fella uh first of all do you know what helado negro means i don't black ice cream Oh, nice. Okay. Ice cream, Negro is black. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting name for an Argus. Maybe it means he's sweet, but also a little dark. Uh, mm -hmm. I found it to be too chill for me. Maybe okay. it's that teenage angst deep down <laughs> I still harbor. That said, like if I was doing something, it's the kind of music I'd want to have playing in the background. I, I did the critical <laughs> listen where you just kind of don't listen to it and don't do anything else and concentrate. And I don't think I would listen to it that way often. That, but I'm not saying he's not good. He's fantastic. And like you, it's nice to see people that have worked really hard in the industry, especially brown people who the media tends to ignore, brown artists. Even if they're innovative and groundbreaking, you know, it takes yeah. people forever to figure out who they are. It's nice to see someone that has worked that long and hard finally start to get some recognition. And hopefully he gets more of it, you know? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see more people celebrating, more people celebrating black and brown and indigenous artists in general. Um, but in terms of this album and, and Gelato Negro, I want to see more people celebrating him for sure. Yeah. And the challenge is like the music's good, but if mm -hmm. nobody tells you about it or you don't discover it, you don't get a chance to know the music's good. And absolutely, you know, brown people are not in charge of the apparatus by which people discover things. Right, which we got to change that too. It, it is, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, as a yeah. artist myself, that's the challenge. I think all artists, no matter what color they are, say, 
hey, if people just get ears on my stuff, there's going to be a subsection. Not everyone's going to like what you do, but there's going to be a subsection that what you do is exactly what they want to hear. How do you get to those people? And it's just for some artists, it's easier to get to those people because the industry supports distribution and advertisement. And for some artists, it is not. Uh, any yeah. brief soapbox ranks about industry bad stuff because we want to try to be positive today. Um, <laughs> we can earmark that for like a future conversation because I have a lot of thoughts on that too. <laughs> me too. We will definitely do that. Uh, the next one on my list is Rhiannon Giddens with uh, her partner Francesco Turisi. Francesco Turisi, who is Italian. This is another one that like my uncle's been telling me about her for forever uh, because she's a black banjo playing country folk artist. Um, and she, I believe, is uh, was in a Grammy-winning band previously. Yes. Chocolate, 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 something. Uh, Carolina Chocolate Drops. Them, yes. I have obviously I haven't actually gone back and listened to those records. I just know that she was in that group. But this is the an album that she put out this year. And imagine, if you will, American folk music and Italian folk music and like Irish Scottish sounding folk music all on the same record. Because that's what this is. It's like folk gone international, and there's lots of influences. And I, there's like a bunch of these songs are covers. I almost think they might all be covers. I am not well versed enough in folk music to know that. But for instance, um, Oh Death is on there, and that's an old school mm -hmm. folk song that a billion people have covered. Uh, Amazing Grace is on there. So for all I know, maybe these are all well known songs, and I just don't know folk well enough to know. But it's, it's, beautifully arranged the the arrangements of these familiar songs are different than what you might be used to rihanna's voice is a otherworldly thing of beauty and there's even a song in italian so there, there's some harmonies and yeah it's great i'm glad i discovered it do you know she's also a classically trained opera singer i did not but that makes sense when you consider her voice right i mean that's yeah. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world, given given what you hear when you listen to her records. Yeah, yeah, she's fantastic. She also hosts a podcast about opera. Um, uh, it's called Aria Code. It's very cool. That is a fantastic name for an opera podcast, and I'm going to have to recommend my wife find that because she loves opera. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I think you dig it, too. <laughs> I don't like opera, but I respect the skill set because... yeah. The ability to sing like that is just like, yeah, I wish I had that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're at six for you, right? Or are we at five for you? Five. All right, five for Juliet. Number five, uh, friend to you and me, Paige Beller, I'll Be Better. That's, that's a great album. Such a great album. Um, I was saying last night on the air that, you know, I get this – luxury that a lot of people don't get which is i get to watch many many artists especially our local and regional artists through sometimes the whole arc of their careers Paige is one of those people so i've known Paige my entire radio career you know i have known Paige the punk rock singer i have known Paige the country singer um and i know Paige in her current iteration and this album is such an achievement she was sending me singles um ahead of the release and uh the first one i was like wow this is amazing like hearing your voice like this this is awesome and then she sent me the second one and i was like oh my wow wow and then she sent me the third one and just mind blown like they just kept getting better and better um to hear Paige um, as a singer really come into her voice in a new and different and so authentic way is just an absolute joy. And to hear her skills as an arranger, because yes. she's playing all the instruments on this album, um, and I've gotten to see her do it live uh, twice now, um, once in the studio at YSO and once at an outdoor show with Lung um, over the summer when, when we felt relatively safe <laughs> doing shows. Um, and it's amazing to watch her just create and craft these huge soundscapes in person as, as one person. Uh, it's, it's such an achievement as an album. I'm so proud of her and I love listening to it. Favorite song on it? Oh, that's so hard. Yeah, um, you have to, I'm, I'm um, making you pick one. Oh man. Um, failed attempts and cigarettes. Nice. Midas collection yeah. of almost. 
Oh, that's a good one too. And yeah. Don't tell anyone. We don't. I don't really have any listeners yet, so no one will know. I'm planning on covering that. I probably won't take it Ooh. to the studio, um, because I don't think I can do it justice. But I love that so much. I think I might have a whack at it. Uh, Ooh, I would like to hear your rendition of that. Yeah. And for folks that haven't seen Paige, when Juliet says she plays all the instruments at, uh, on the record, that's different than live because at live he does them all at the same time. Like, yeah. <laughs> imagine if you will, a person like as humans, we only have four appendages that can do stuff. Paige will be playing a different instrument on each appendage <laughs> mm-hmm. while singing. And I don't even want to think about how many hours one would have to rehearse to be able to pull that nonsense off. So I feel like the studio is probably she can relax and only play one thing at a time, maybe, maybe two things at a time. Yeah. <laughs> like, I go see her live and I'm like, well, we don't deserve her. <laughs> That's, that's a good choice. It's a, it's a really good record. People should buy the, the Paige Bella record. Support your local independent artists, Dayton folks who are listening. Uh, the next one on my list is Jackie Vincent's Love Transcends, and she was supposed to stop by Dayton on her tour. She did not, which makes me very happy that I saw her in Columbus on her tour and got a chance to meet her and talk music business. And but She is a good blues guitarist that just shreds and most of her original work leans more rock and roll influence and jazz influence. Uh, her background is she's a classically trained piano player and went to Berkeley and then decided that piano music wasn't for her. She wanted to rock. So she switched to guitar. That's my kind of, my kind of person. This new record she put out this year, she wanted to do something more traditionally bluesy. I guess when you're from Texas, you feel like you need to do some Texas Texas blues stuff. So this one leans a little bit more closer to traditional blues than most of her work. There's a cover on there that's a mashup between an old Sister Rosetta Tharp song and an old Negro spiritual, which is awesome. But even though it's closer to traditional blues, she still does it her own way, and it's a great, great record. And I would say if you're going to start with her catalog, I would tell you to start with her her live disc that she did on her Austin City Limits appearance because there's something special about recordings that are made at that at Austin City Limits. They all sound so good. I say start there. That's where I discovered her and then branch out. But yeah, this one's called Love Transcends. And the way she described it on her Bandcamp page is uh, written across a decade. So some of these songs she's had around for a while. Recorded in a pandemic played in a style a century old that's a better summary than i could give it so and she's just a nice person my my wife and i met her she's just we're rooting for her that's awesome yeah. what uh, an evocative description too yeah simple but like yeah i wonder if she wrote that herself or if she had a pr professional because i would not be able to come up with something like that <laughs> i guess you know when you're an indie artist you kind of have to be a pr professional these days yeah essentially yeah or or have have some friends that are writers and yep. be like what do you hear when you hear this <laughs> yep uh your number four my number four was pom-pom squad death of a cheerleader now this this one takes me back to like my you know 90s alt rock girl band days um in the best way possible you know pom-pom squad is a newer band um came out of a solo project is now a full band and i love that it makes me think of you know bands like veruca salt and garbage and you know all all those classic like 90s either all women bands or women fronted bands um and yet they managed to sound really really fresh they sort of honor that style um but they're also making it their own it's um just a great rock album and they um put out a cover which thank you by the way i have to thank you for sending me the cover the not a surf cover like the instant it came out, I was so excited about that. So they get extra, Pom Pom Squad gets extra bonus points from me just for covering Not A Surf's popular, um, which Such was so a well great. Done job. Yeah, yeah. My 90s heart just, you know. <laughs> well, so first of all, that album, her album, their album's really fun. It, it's, yeah. a, it's a solid rock and roll record. I enjoyed it. And it, it ends up on a lot of critics lists this year. If, you, if you're a person that likes to read journalism top lists, you'll see this one in a lot of places. Aside from the music, Mia, the the lead singer lady and guitarist, is like a marketing and PR genius and has a very Mm -hmm. carefully crafted persona 
as far as the way she dresses and the branding and it doesn't take away from the music but like these days you kind of have to almost right to get attention <clears throat> and and she said she was going to do that not a surf thing wait, months before she actually did it and matthew cause was actually like yeah that sounds like that's cool so he he gave blessing and they actually went on tour with not a surf this year and i'm sure that the conversations about doing that right what else are you going to talk about on on the road for a few months and for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a shot for shot remake of the original video. Uh, Matthew Cause from Not a Surf is singing some harmonies on it. <clears throat> but the attention to detail, like, uh, and I didn't notice this, but I, this, I found this online, so I can't take credit, but there's a scene where the football coach is yelling at the players. And then the Not a Surf video is the drummer who's the coach. So. In the Pom Pom Squatch video, their drummer's a lady. It's the drummer who's the football player. Nice. Like, <laughs> little stuff. Um, it's it's excellent. And first of all, that song is a killer. It's mm -hmm. a great song. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure they've they've. I'm surely they've let, they've added that to their live repertoire when they're not with not a surf. I don't think you can pull that off and not like play it in front of people at a show. So yeah. People should definitely oh, yeah. go check that out, especially if you like Not A Surf or 90s music at all, or just well done homages. I even went to the same high school that Not A Surf shot it at and got the current kids to dress up in their school gear and do it. And yeah, it's, I was jealous. I was like, man, I wish I could do something like that. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, my next one is Mars Volta's this is going to be hard to explain. So Mark Volta put out a record in 2003, which I happen to really like, uh, D-Laos and the Comatorium. It's weird and wild. And I will say that it's poppy only because it's got a lot of hooks and catchy melodies, but it is not remotely close to anything that's pop music. <laughs> modern, in fact, I feel like modern listeners, Generation Z, when even the songs are long and they're, and you don't know what he's singing about. A lot of it makes no sense. But it's just, it's great, great music. The musicians are at the top of their game. The guitar interplay, I think I remember reading somewhere that Flea sat in and did the bass work on this record. So I, if you need a substitute, you're not going to find a better one than that guy. Um, it's great. And very, very well produced and, and honed in the studio. So what they released this year is unfinished original recordings of that record. So the songs are the same but the sound of them is completely different. They didn't, they hadn't gone to the big money producer yet. So the mix is different. A lot of them, you hear the vocals a lot better. So the lyrics are even more nonsense because, oh, that's what he really said. I still don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them, you can kind of hear instrument parts that didn't make the final cut. The song's the same, but like the the approach to layering the instruments or a counter melody is different. And if you like the original D Laos and the Comatorium at all, you have to go listen to this. If you don't, I think it's still brilliant, even if you don't know this band, you just won't appreciate it the same way that someone who already knows these songs does. The songs are great. The songs are absolutely fantastic. And as a musician myself, who is way too chicken to show somebody a first pass of a song. I think it, it shows something that they're willing to go to throw this out there. This stuff's clearly not done. I mean, to them, because they obviously went a different direction with these songs. But to me, like if I put out a record like this, I'd be proud of it. But for a band like the Mars Volta, this wasn't it, which makes it, you know, I find that to be really intriguing. I'm always, it's, it's always interesting that the choice to like put out those recordings, you know, those, those unfinished early kind of recordings, it, it seems really, um, I don't know, you have to be pretty confident in your work or confident that you have a listener base that is interested enough or yep. forgiving enough or what, or whatever it is to connect with, um, the sort of naked version of, uh, of those songs. And for them, it's probably the latter because they're not a band anymore. I mean, those guys are all still around. Um, but, right. But they have a relatively rabid fan base, I think. And hey, if you need a quick buck, I'm not saying that's why they did it. But if you have people that will support you and want to know more about your creative process, why not share that mm -hmm. with them? So that's that's what they did here, I think. Anyway, Absolutely. I love it. Uh, what, what's your number three? 
<laughs> my number three, Kay Carter and Tino, the Safe Money EP. Um, I I love that EP. I love those guys individually. They are both so talented, um, and together they're just a tour de force. Um, it, it's Mimosas was was it's and should jam. forever be. It's the jam. It's the song of the summer song of summer 2021 and all summers henceforth um but what i like about it is both of these guys have been making music for a long time and you can hear uh the work that they've put in the maturity in what they're doing you can also hear them honoring the music that they loved and their musical roots in the music that they're making now without it seeming derivative you know they're still making something new and fresh and so very their own with just a little hat tip here and there to uh the artists and the music that they, that they came up listening to they have the ability to be both funny and serious within the same ep yep. um and and to really um take you um to places and into experiences that are going to make you laugh they're going to make you dance they're also going to make you think they're going to make you get angry um it's it's a real it's a real achievement my favorite track on that one strangely enough is not mimosa it's it's the way that i feel because i love that one too that song's yeah. very much the way that i feel it's like i feel like it was like they were talking to me mimosas though i mean that bass line is <laughs> So good. It's so good. And, and that's a video, Dayton, Ohio funk bass line right there. <laughs> the video is so well done. And those yeah. guys are so talented. Hey, hey, K Carter and Tino, I hope you're listening. I'm gonna ask you guys one thing to do in the future. Put your lyrics out there. And this is an old person request. Some of us, when we were kids, would have the lyrics in the CD and read them and sit with them and mull them over. Y'all are moving so fast with your rhymes. When you drop something that hits, we don't have a chance to process it because you're on to the next rhyme, and that's cool. But sometimes you want to sit with something and think about it, and it would be very nice for us old folks if I could go to your page and find the lyrics to all the songs, so then I could, as a songwriting nerd myself, really take it apart and digest. You guys write such clever stuff. <laughs> More clever than most rappers I listen to, and maybe I'm just not listening to enough indie rap, but clever and literate. And like Juliet said, you guys go from funny to serious, angry to sad. And some of those, some of those lyrics, I come away going, ah, that's a, that is a profound lyric, and I would like to ruminate on it, and, but I can't. I got to keep up the rest of the track. So it's just something I would like to see y'all do in the future for us old people, please. <laughs> uh, the next one for me is 80 of Victoria's A Southern Gothic, which my uncle had not heard of her, so I got him on this. Oh, nice. And uh, so 80 Victoria is from South Carolina, and she's another person that's been at the music business for forever. And if I remember the story I read on her interview that she gave, she was working at an Amazon warehouse or something when she tracked this out. <laughs> like she wasn't on the road with her band because she had to make money. Um, and it's a masterpiece and she's been out uh, touring. Uh, she did some time on the road this year, which is nice. Go go do what you really want to do. But this song, this, this album is kind of like a love letter to her home. She's a black woman from the South. And one of the songs on there is uh, specifically about being a black woman from the South and not putting up, not wanting to put up with like having to be forgiving and kind to people that don't deserve it all the time. That's, that's a pretty cool jam. But the entire record is great. It's another one of those a little bit bluesy, a little bit soulful, a little bit country. She's from South Carolina. She wrote, she wrote the music the way that she heard music growing up. She wears her influences on her sleeve. Great record, a Southern Gothic. Go listen to it. Crank it up loud. Uh, I, I took this quote from her interview in Rolling Stone. She said, she, I wanted to include myself in the history of the South. I wanted to make this young Black girl's narrative just as emblematic of a Southern experience as Faulkner could write. Mm, love right? that. Yeah. yeah, like so she's she's got like a specific goal, not just to make music. We all want to make music, but she wants to be remembered and wants to show people that there are more voices representing where she is from than just the famous white guy. Mm -hmm. I think she was successful. 
Like there, there are things on this album that you can tell she's clearly angry or frustrated, but you can also tell she loves her home. So yeah, Andy and Victoria is great. I hope I get a chance to see her on tour. Uh, your number two. My number two, Lung, Come Clean Right Now. So we talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, Kate and Daisy are just, you know, really coming into their own. As a duo, they are so tight. Like that musical partnership is just incredible. Uh, this album was written and recorded entirely during the pandemic. They had another album that was ready to go um, for maybe a 2020 release at some point. And um they still have not released that yet. Uh, they created this entirely during isolation, collaborating mostly virtually until it was safe to start playing together in the studio again. Um, and I feel like it's such a reflection of what we were all going through and continue to go through uh, with their signature heavy, yet thoughtful sound. Um, and as you said earlier, Mike, they really um captured more fully that live experience because they are such an amazing live band and you really get a lot of that vibe and feeling on this album yep yeah basically go get this one everybody yeah you, you won't be disappointed yeah and then go see them live when they come to a city near you because they're and, phenomenal even if you live in europe they might very well come to a city near you they've done that yes. before so let's, let's hope it gets safe for them to travel so they can go take their music to as many people as they can because they're great Mm -hmm. Ohio is better for having lung. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> my next one's Eric Bibb, and I found this because my uncle told me to go listen to it, and I had never heard of the guy, and he's got like 20 records, because of course he does. So I, I look him up, and he's in his 70s, but he looks like he's about my age, so I'm either doing something very wrong, or he is just really taking good care of himself. And he's from the States, but lives in, I believe, the U.K., he lives not in the United States. I'm, I don't want to, I'm probably wrong about the country, but he is an expat, but obviously still loves his home. And the record he put out this year is called Dear America. And the cover is of him holding an American flag and a guitar in what looks like a harvested cornfield. It's very bluesy, also a little bit folky. He's got a soulful voice. He's got things to say the guy's in his 70s he has lived a long time and he has seen a lot of crazy stuff and he has a lot of life to ruminate on and i'm just impressed that you that he can put out more than 20 albums and he still has things that weigh on him that he needs to express through music uh he's got a song on there called emmett's ghost uh, which is obviously about emmett till and that oh that hit me right in the <laughs> mm -hmm. in the feels as the kids say but Go get the new Eric the record. He's uh, Dear America. He has things to say. I have not yet started working my way back through his catalog. I will because he's got a lot of stuff. But so thanks, Uncle Brian, for telling me to check that guy out. All right, Juliet, your favorite album of 2021. The time has come. The time has come. Japanese Breakfast Jubilee, which. If you know me, is not a surprising choice because no. I've been telling everybody about this album and I've been playing it nonstop since it came out. Um, this is a really, it's a really special album. Um, you know, you can't talk about the album without talking about Michelle Michelle Zahner's book, Crying in H Mart, as well, which came out before the album. Um, that book chronicling her experience as a caretaker when her mother passed away uh, from cancer. The album. Um, is more of an attempt at finding joy. You know, her prior album was very much about mourning the loss of her mother and processing that experience of caretaking. This album still has some melancholy to it, but is definitely reaching toward some kind of joy or, or is more of an album of seeking, I would say. It is very catchy, very sonically interesting. She bounces around through a lot of different styles of music throughout the album, but it still seems very cohesive. That can be a really hard thing to achieve as an artist. Um, sometimes if you try to do too many styles on an album, it just seems a little disorganized or disjointed. This album definitely uh, feels very, very cohesive. It's the one I've just been telling everybody, like, have you heard it? You need to listen to it. Um, and I, I can listen to it front to back 
kind of nonstop. And I'm always hearing something new, discovering a new line or a lyric that interests me, um, hearing something in the instrumentation or the arrangement that I hadn't heard before. So it's uh, one that I keep discovering things about, which um, always, you know, that's important to me in an album. Like if I'm going to call an album my number one, it needs to have some staying power. And I think this one does. Favorite song? Yeah. Favorite song? Oh, which one? Which one? Ooh, ooh. Okay, that's that's really hard because it depends on my mood. It is either Be Sweet or Posing in Bondage because those are two very different songs. (laughs) Hey, my favorite song is Posing for Cars. Maybe I wrote the name down wrong. No, there's one called There's There's one called Posing for Cars. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So (laughs) I listened to this no probably the early fall. Mm-hmm. But I've been seeing it on people's favorite lists. All like as soon as it dropped, it got a lot of raves. And you'll see it again on if you read music blogs and journalists, it crops up in a lot of people's best of lists. It's a good album. Uh, Posing for Cards is definitely the one that stood out to me. I wish I could remember why. I'm gonna have to go listen to it again. But I wrote that down. I was like, Posing for Cards is the song for this record. That's another artist that's worked pretty hard for a long time and it's starting to get uh, more recognition so the hard work can ad- can eventually pay off mm-hmm. uh, my favorite album of the year I didn't really number the other ones but uh, mine actually came out in December so it didn't make anybody's list because a lot of your industry colleagues have their list done at the middle of November <laughs> sometimes earlier honestly yeah. so like you said if you want to be on these lists don't put a record out in December but the, uh, mm-hmm. Failure dropped their latest record in December uh, that, that's a band that I loved when I was a teenager they broke up disappeared for 17 years and came back to us in 2014 and they put out a lot of work since they have a habit to make concept albums long artistic statements they even intentionally write segues to connect certain songs together and when they play these albums live they'll if they're going to play the album in order or play a couple of songs they'll even throw in this play the instrumental segue live they're old guys like you know like me actually they're older than me but you know they they, they see the album as an art form they didn't do that this time i feel like they're trying to adapt to the modern listener music habit and and they said this in interviews they made a conscious decision to write a little tighter to bring the runtime of their album down to make something that a young person could put on a playlist uh, i would not be comfortable like their older work don't you can't put it on a playlist it doesn't sound right at least to me out of context so i'm going to sit down and spend the hour or more it takes to get through a failure concept album they realize that a lot of people don't write that way anymore so they switch their style as far as the album as a whole as far as what it sounds like it still sounds like them the loud songs are still big and atmospheric and they've got the space influence the quiet songs are still delicate and two of the guys in the band are engineer producers when they're not in their band so they're really really um choosy about their sound so everything they do sounds pristine uh it's my favorite thing that i heard this year i'm just kind of a bum that they've waited all year to release the thing but hopefully they'll take it on the road. Hopefully it's safe enough for them to go on the road next year and then tour in front of the people. So I know I had a lot of non rock and roll albums on my list, which is a new thing for me, but yeah, my, my favorite album is just, it's a rock and roll record failure. It's called wild type droid. I love it when one of those, again, this is kind of going full circle to the first album that you talked about. I love it when an artist or a band that has been with you for a while can continue to impress you and yeah. continue, can continue to make music that that resonates, not just like, oh, nostalgia, like, oh, I love these guys, but can can really impress you that much um, and can, you know, adapt as they need to, to the market at hand to hopefully get, you know, new ears on their work and to still hold true to whatever it is about their music that, that is resonating with you. It shows a certain amount of, uh, savvy, I think. Absolutely. But yeah. They're awesome. So thank you, Juliet, for taking the time to talk to me. Um, even though, yeah, I'm new at this whole podcasting thing, of course, but, and, and you, 
you mentioned when we first started that you have a podcast. This is where I'm going to want you to plug it. So if okay. someone other than like, you know, your fantastic radio show work, which I'll also link to your shows in the show notes. If someone wanted to go find your podcast, tell us what it's called and what it's about <laughs> and all that good stuff. Absolutely. So my podcast is a non-musical thing, which is which is rare for me, but but good because I do spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about music. Um, so it's nice to think about and talk about, you know, some other things every once in a while, I guess. <laughs> um, it's called Attack of the Final Girls. Uh, my friend Teresa and I talk about horror films. Um, we are both uh, fans of the genre, but we also realize that in a lot of horror media, it's still predominantly dominated by white men. So um, we're two white women. So we have a ways to go to, but we want to really look at horror films through a lens of feminism, through a lens of progressivism, through a lens of how we're treating and portraying characters and groups and people um and really highlight and uplift some of the work that's doing it well talk about the nostalgic stuff that maybe didn't do it so well but you know um how do we how do we grapple with you know some of those older things that maybe we liked when we were 13 but uh have some real problems now um yeah so we're brand new we just launched in november we do typically it's a movie a week we might do um some mini episodes focusing on some of the streaming tv shows that you see on netflix and shutter but that's us attack of the final girls find us where you get your podcasts yes thank you for that and we will have to make arrangements for you to come back and we'll nerd out some more i would love that yeah i would love that definitely Thank you, dear listener, for listening to this bonus episode, episode one half. On Wednesday, January 5th, you get episode one, an interview with talented Canadian musician, Baby Molly. Hey, if you feel like it, why don't you subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice and maybe even leave a review? Thanks. Thanks.